So if I ever actually go back to the point where I was, let me actually you know, pick up where I left. Robert Bork was really the person depicted as a steadfast guardian of the conservative values. But he was a like hardliner who would have recognized the no compromise with Liberals who might actually not see eye to eye with them on so many important issues. But the problem is, some of his qualities were definitely vitiated because of this political culture favoring the high octane partisanship. That means you can never go beyond the party line. That type of uh, betrayal could never be tolerated. So Joe Biden, who already launched his own campaign in B2, become a president of the United States for the first time, was very eager to. make this case federal because this is really the last bastion that should have never be breached in terms of uh, keeping what's been so sacred for the minds of progressives. The hotly contested key issues like abortions, racial segregation, women's rights, religious freedom, freedom of speech or privacy these are just simply being threatened democrats are considered this invitation by president reagan as the existential threat. They realize if this would be successfully secured, then all the hard feats achieved by the sacrifice of a liberal judges in and outside the core were likely to be washed away and annihilated. It's really like the TNT bomb that would obliterate, that would obliterate all of the critical jobs done by their predecessors in the political pedigree. That was really the notion. But let me actually advisors told him to be succinct, not lecture the senators. I'd be happy to answer for these judges. He did not follow their instructions. Mm -hmm. Robert Bork was, in the first place, told by his advisors from the committee counseling him to be very succinct. He was demanded by his counselors who helped him to <coughs> finish up this prepping that he should never teach them. Those high-minded or even actually pro, uh, full of pride senators would never like to hear a lecture from you. You should never actually deliver a professorial instruction, but you should actually be very quick and snappy and uh, succinct on your point. That's very important. But he didn't follow that. His job was a legal scholar. That means he was a teaching at the university. He couldn't do away with his habitual trait coming from his day job. Hold on, hold on a second. Well, let me, let, let me pick that strain up. All right, but, I, but I'd like to get on the record right now that I don't feel very free to disregard what Congress decided. The mere fact that a law is outrageous is not enough to make it unconstitutional. Aha, uh -huh. he was a very... 
instructive, right? Let me actually, you know, rectify this. The fact that, you know, the law is very outrageous, that does not mean the law would be unconstitutional. If you ever actually pick up on the very depraved physiology of a such a draconian law, like separate but equal, that does not mean this would make that law unconstitutional or incompatible with the Constitution. Wow. He's been just trying to deliver a lecture to somebody who has a power to decide he's a fate. He was very professorial, right? That's interesting. <laughs> you know, he didn't actually, at that time, think that it was going well. But he was, you know, Robert Borg's son, whose name is Robert Borg Jr. So he thought that it was just heartbreaking because it was just like torture. Because his father was being tormented. Literally, he was being bombarded with the sharp-tongued and acrimonious and sometimes brutal and ruthless questions coming from all different corners. Mm -hmm. he, he really actually you know, wish he could have actually you know, reached out to his father in the midst of this hearing. But that, that, could, that couldn't be done, right? But he really actually thought he could actually, you know, at least cheer him up by saying, you can't be treated in that way. They can't do this to you. You can't be that way. It's so mean, right? Everything was really nasty. He wanted to actually, you know what, approach his father and tap him on the shoulder. Can't be done. Can't be doing that. Can't be done that way. Like this. Because it was a really kind of a vicious the whole media circuit truly amped up the very visceral attack coming from all different angles, right? Because this was, you know, in the first place, a high-octane and high, uh, politically charged circus. But that aspect was simply sharpened because of this media whose hunger could not easily be satiated unless there is high-profile rift between two parties, right? Always, if there was a two players, they m must have a very brutal, self-destructive fight. And that way, they can actually jack up the viewers' ratings. Huh. <laughs> That's really the nature of the media. Hammering you for that for five days. That means that I'm actually you know, pummeling you with that question for five days. I'm actually you know, asking you to answer that question and be specific about that issue for five days. I'm actually you know, honing on that question with the very specified aim to obtain an answer from you. I just want you to answer it. Specifically, in the end, in an effort to save him, Bork supporter Wyoming Senator Alan Simpson asked him one last question. Why do you want to be an associate justice? Mm -hmm. That's in a Republican senator from Wyoming whose name is Alan Simpson out of desperate trial to save the face of a Bork who was vitiated by harsh attacks coming from Democrats. He asked this question. This was just like simply saving the pri saving Private Ryan type of questions. He was very desperate to at least be a 
desperate to be a sympathizer for Robert Bork. This was really like out of compassion. Why would you want to be a associate justice in the Supreme Court? Can you explain to us? Wow. If I ever actually explain further, his boat was sinking. He was uh, completely pummeled with the bullets coming from every corner. He couldn't take it anymore. However, he's a fellow Republican, Alan Simpson, a senator from Wyoming, somehow felt very sympathetic to his cause. So he actually asked uh, one final question that could have truly support him emotionally. This was a sign of solidarity. It was his final desperate trial to do something for Robert Bork. The United States Supreme Court, many believe Bork Hanser was the death nail of his nomination. Mm -hmm. Many believe that this was a death nail of a Robert Bork. You know what? Many people in retrospect really thought that he's a final remark in response to fellow Republicans desperate trial to rescue him was indeed a death blow and death nail. That was the end of the game. It was so fatal. He made one grave mistake whose gravity was menacing enough to kill his nomination. Pew. That one final shot was so light threatening, so he chances to become the U.S. Supreme Court were dead on the spot. Oh, period. Let me actually... Look. Many believe that in retrospect. Oh, that was really the reason why that was almost like abject, bottomless pit. He couldn't never actually rescue himself from that. What did he say? I think it would be an intellectual feast. I think it would be, an, I mean, mentally great to demonstrate and flaunt off his proficiency as a jurist. Because these jobs are only for people with a cerebral capacity. And he just really, like, he really wants to revive the legacy of a plutocracy where privileged white men can dominate all different areas and arenas of our lifetime in support of their like-minded beliefs and tenets. So no women and no colored can ever share the common space or enjoy the same prerogatives they enjoy because they do not believe in the quality of them. So he actually believed it would be more like intellectual feast. He really actually knows us um, see his job as a um, chance to brag about his superiority instead of serving people who might support him or who might actually grant that kind of power to him. Being a justice in the Supreme Court would it not entail a prerogative privilege, enabling him to flaunt off his ingeniosity or intellectual acuity or acumen. No, this is really the place to be humble because you are going to be a uh, modest servant of the people 
we the people who put you in that position in consideration of their welfare, you have to carry the atlas on your shoulder. This was what it was supposed to be. He said that. I think this would be more like, I think, again, not really believe. It's not really a very heartfelt belief, but he actually uses his reason again to say that. I I think this would be more like, this would be more like intellectual feast. I think it's a really the festivity where I can relish in the God-given talent of mine like this. Wow. It's really crazy. You know what? The more and more bad news than a pummel then. This was really a death blow. Some actually called it death nail. This told a death nail. Ding, 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 ding. He's gone. <laughs> but to me, it sounds really like death blow. Pew. There's a fatal shot. Smothered him. The smother his chance. There could have been no chance he could have turned it around. Because he thought that it was just appealing to his capacity. It's really, it's really great ch chance to, you know, enjoy his brilliance while actually, you know, accomplishing some of the tasks suitable for his intellectual brilliance. Huh. This is really like solving cross puzzles. Because I'm smart, I can handle it. Yay! What a great chance to brag about my my brilliance. Yay! Are you sure you're supposed to serve the people? Be a big thing, yeah, a what the hell? That's the Washington. Normally, this type of sardonic and uh, very hmm, sarcastic nature is really prevalent in in Washington. Um, if I ever actually avoid that adjective, it's really the dominant and recurring theme, like a light motive. When you actually make certain type of audacious or relatively bumptious comment like that intellectual face, it would be more like, excuse me, we do not expect that kind of a comment from a public servant because, you know, in the first place, you were supposed to humble yourself and lower your ego to serve the people by putting people's interests ahead of your, your own. That was really the expected answer. Why do you, why would you ever want to be the Supreme Court Justice? think I would like to humbly use my vehicle to convey social justice to every corner of our society like this. It's just something that must be very, very, um, no matter how cheesy that might be, that's really kind of the model example. You know, you must actually use a humble or humiliation or humility. Humiliation is mortification. And the humility is really humbleness. You have to actually make the distinction, but you actually use that kind of a mortifying sentiment. Despite the limited capacity of mine, if I would ever be given that type of opportunity, like if I ever be selected as a conveyor of justice, and I would put my eyes on the prize of justice among all, like this, or whatever. You actually have to say something very statesmanlike. Remark, right? Tell the truth, it should be a mixture between humiliation and uh, humbleness. Because you have to actually, you know what, embarrass yourself. 
even making self-deprecating comment because they never like the notion of seeing your ego flying high that's in the first place the beginning of the fall out for many of a nominees who would like to be confirmed but definitely that does not mean you should actually be so pathetic sycophant or a mini on who would say yes to everyone no So instead of actually saying that he would like to show mercy, he would like to serve the people, he would like to protect the people's rights, like that's something that might actually be so conventional from those type of honored officials in our society. He said it would be, I think it would be like um, intellectual feast. You know, he actually had a certain sense of humor. I think it would be like intellectual feast. And most of the people say, who's the dinner then? Who's paying for the dinner? And who's the dinner? That means in what type of a game are you going to sacrifice? I mean, who's going to be on your plate? And who's going to pay for that? That was a real question. Think about it. <laughs> It's very interesting. He, the, the very tonality self is a full of uh, intellectual superiority. I can sense that. I, I've never heard about it. I think it would be like intellectual feast. You know, the very tonality. Think about it. I, the way he actually speaks, like, huh, I think it would be like an intellectual feast. I think, you know what? It's like, you know, I'm solving the toughest, you know, math problem, which I could actually truly deem. My intellectual brilliance. This would be a great opportunity for me to actually demonstrate how brilliant and smart I am. You know, like this. You know, I can actually feel that kind of uh, arrogance there. Don't you not actually feel that? It deserves my own brilliance. Like, that was really the notion. Let me actually quickly check one thing. Yeah. Regular order will be followed. Clerk will continue calling the roll. The bunker is no. Mr. Burdick. Bork's candor has become a liability. Mr. Fulton, the Democrats, and even some liberal Republicans. Mr. Um, Bork's and Candor somehow became his liability. That means that he was too frank and candid about some of the uh, issues that could have been mitigated. He had no interest in modulating his tone. So he actually, you know, 
went further into his beliefs. He elaborated on some of the controversial viewpoints that could have been suppressed or smothered by him, but he actually had a no filter powerful enough to stifle his brutal honesty. It was deemed completely improper by many. Even actually many liberal Republicans on the fringe of the Republican Party deemed his speech improper. He was not suitable for that job. He was not at all considered discreet and thoughtful to presume that title. But hold on a second, let me actually find one thing. I just really want to actually say something. So it was indeed in a very high profile defeat. That means it was a resounding defeat. This was almost ne for the first time in the history of the United States. Any nomination procedure for a justice in the Supreme Court gather it this nationwide attention. It means there was almost no equivalent hearing for a nominee. And it wants nomination in this way. But that means you know most of uh high ranking Republicans paid the price for this type of public humiliation. Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, no. The job was to cut this guy down. Mm -hmm. So the job was to cut this guy down. That means, you know, the actual test was to literally blot out his chances to be a Supreme Court judge. That means he, there should be no visible scenario enabling him to become the U.S. Supreme Court justice. That was really the very idea prevailing. And it was a very powerful. Because the result was 42 to 58. 58 members of the Senate said no, nay, he should never be our Supreme Court justice. That was the very politicized defeat. Many of Republican senators felt that their own ego was bruised because this was immediate confrontation to tackle the very fundamental beliefs held by Republicans. They took it personally. This was in this this was a immediate insult at their ego and at their reputation. Even there were certain deserters who actually crossed the party lines to vote for Democrats. 
I mean, vote with the Democrats. Vote for his drop down, for sure.